Well, thanks for coming this afternoon. I want to thank I thank uh, Ben, Adrian, and, and Alejandro for putting a great call seminar series together. The talks been fantastic. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to Ben showing us some wonderful pictures. Ben and I talked last year, um, I don't know, in the spring. And at that point, I kind of, I know he's got an office, by the chair's office, but I, I never knew what he did, actually. And uh, once we got to meet, I'm talking about what you're doing. I'm like, well, you just have to give a talk. So a brief a brief description. Um, ben, ben Becker is a National Park Service Science Advisor and Research Coordinator for the California Cooperative Extension Studies Unit at UC Berkeley. So I found out that's what you do, or that's who you are. I'm going to find out what you do today. Uh, he's also a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley's Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management. Previously, he worked for the National Park Service at Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, ben holds a PhD from UC Berkeley, didn't go too far away, master's in forestry from Yale, as well as two BAs from UC from UCLA. Ben, welcome. Floor is yours. Um, yeah, so thank you, Michael. And um, yeah, this is a great opportunity for me to talk a little bit about what it is that I do, why I'm here on campus, what the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit is. Um, the, almost everybody thinks I'm Cooperative Extension, and it, it seems like a really difficult thing to try and describe the difference. Um, and, you know, Michael, when you said, now you kind of at least have written down what it is that I do, um, it is an incredibly I don't want to say nebulous position, but it's not an easy one to kind of get your head around. So hopefully by the end of this, we'll have our head around it a little bit. Um, this is the next slide, thank you. So um, what I want to do is I'm going to have four little sections. I want to talk a little bit about the Californian Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit, and I'll use the acronym CESU. Um, then I want to talk about two research programs that I've been working on uh, for the past couple of years. Um, they're not really CESU projects, it's just getting an insight into a little bit of the research that I work on, some of the collaborations that I work on. And then at the end, I want to talk about student research, education, and field stations, and some of the work that I've been doing before I came here, but mostly over the past two years here working with students and trying to integrate them into, um, into National Park Service and other federal science projects and federal science needs and at the same time, give those students a great benefit. Michael already kind of gave my background, so this slide is going to be really quick. I started at ESPOM, worked for the Park Service for 20 years, um, nearby in Northern California, over at Point Reyes National Seashore, um, working in a variety of roles there. Um, as you can imagine, Park Service, a lot of our federal agencies, often we have shrinking budgets or static budgets, so when I started there, I was a marine ecologist, and then after a few years, I was a marine ecologist and a science advisor, and then by the time I left, I was all three of those positions, which originally were three different positions. So we have sort of contraction, which is one of the reasons we do need to work with folks in the university so much because we don't have as much capacity as we used to. And now um, the position I'm in, as Michael kind of described, is this California Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit. And it's a partnership between Park Service and also several other federal agencies. And Berkeley College of Natural Resources is the host campus. So this Consortium, which I'll show in a few more slides, involves a lot of federal agencies, but also many of the campuses in California. And it's really about federal and partner co-generated research, education, and technical assistance. So from the producers, which are you folks, to the consumers, which um, are us specs. And um, Dennis, who was here um, as the, as the Associate Dean for the College of Natural Resources serves as the director of this California um, Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit. So he's the one that keeps the train um, on the tracks. So um, I want to kind of try and split my job into two different parts um, that are complementary. So this is an image of the National Parks of California, kind of a cartoonish image. And they're about 25 to 30, depending on how you count them, uh, National Park Service units in California, you can see that they really represent a lot of the landscape, a lot of significant natural resources and cultural resources. And my job as a science advisor is to help these parks um, get the best science and also often consult with them on helping to make conservation management decisions. 
Um, a lot of that is not necessarily all my expertise, but a lot of it is getting the right people in the room and getting the right research in the room to help those parks better make decisions. A lot of it is also about going outside their borders. Uh, like a lot of federal agencies, like a lot of groups, we're often too in sort. We're not cooperating across and outside of our boundaries, especially with how much we need to think about our climate change impacts and whatever other environmental threats we have that are threatening inside the parks. So we need to think about these on a safe scale. So a lot of my work is also thinking about the 30 by 30 project in California, trying to protect 30% of California's lands and some sort of protection for biodiversity by 2030. So um, I'm working and I'm joining the California Biodiversity Network and also the State of California Biodiversity Council to try and help at least these parks think on a more landscape scale and how we can do monitoring and also conservation across boundaries. So this plot um, is a plot of all the federal agencies that are involved in these cooperative ecosystem studies unit projects in California. So from USGS, U.S. Geological Survey at the bottom, up to Bureau of Land Management and Air Force at the top. And over our last review period from 2018 to 2022, we had about 450 projects that we were able to find. There probably were more than 500. Um, so on the y-axis there, it's a number of projects you can see it going up to the 400 area. And I'm going to show you a plot that also shows our partners on the right and who all of these agencies are working with. And when I say a project, I mean a funded project it could be for anthropological research or for ethnography or for monitoring a bird species or for developing a plan for restoration. So whole variety, but also Bureau of Indian Affairs just going, so we don't have any projects with them yet. So on the right, you can see most of the universities in California, all the UCs, many of the Cal State, sorry about the small pond, some of the private universities, some of the NGOs, they're all members of this consortium. So we're able to really easily set up projects with them and have frequent conversations with them about what our research needs are. The bulk of our projects across all the agencies are with UCs. And um, let me guess that's about 20% of them, maybe 25% are with the Cal State University campuses. Um, you can see in the middle, uh, National Park Service really has the most projects. And we don't spend the most money on projects, but we have the most projects. And you can see we spread them around and have a lot of partnerships through most of our partners. Um, and you can see like Fish and Wildlife Service, for instance, works a lot with UC Davis. National Park Service works a lot with UC Davis. Um, so I, I find that this plot can really paint a picture of what's going on with this ESU and all the connections. And again, these are all sorts of projects across all the scholarly fields that federal agencies need information for. So here's an example of some of the projects that we just set up this past year with um, different faculty on campus from ethnography and Caribbean parks all the way to um, working with the data science, data, um, data science for environment program on the far right, helping our parks in the West think about climate vulnerability and resilience in our National Park Service units and really taking our data and turning it into information. And if people have more questions, um, I'm right across the hall, but also we've had a couple of Berkeley students Help us over the past year really put together a website that um, you can see there are projects up there that kind of describe all the projects that we've got going on um, to get a full picture of things that are going on. And maybe even more importantly, um, a picture of where you might want to fit in or talk about potential projects that might be coming down the line for developing projects. So that's my quick and dirty overview of the CESU. Um, now I'm going to talk about a seabird oceanography project that I've been working on for a while and the seagrass restoration project I've been working on for a while. These are not CESU projects. This is more like in my own um, research that I do as a science advisor to help out parks. Um, but before that, um, I need to at least give you a little bit of satisfaction for all the pretty pictures that I showed at the very beginning. Um, some other projects that I'm involved with, mostly kind of as the, the, the come towards the end and help us turn this data into information. So a lot of long-term monitoring programs, um, you know, what do all of these patterns mean? What do they mean in terms of how we should manage these resources in the future? Um, so elephant seals, you know, this male that you're looking at is probably a four and a half to 5,000 pound male. These populations were thought to be extinct about a hundred years ago. Now they've come back and there are over 300,000 of them in the Northeast Pacific. And, um, we're trying to understand how those populations are spreading and trying to understand what it is that triggers a new colony formation based on environmental conditions and 
how crowded the beaches get. And they're becoming kind of, um, you know, 300,000 of them, and a lot of those hauling out on our beaches. It's not becoming a human wildlife conflict, but it's becoming a human wildlife question on how these uh, things are managed. So having some predictions for the future are helpful. Um, we just published a paper this was with a student from San Francisco State. Um, this is a species of bird that breeds both in San Francisco Bay, but also out in the Pacific Ocean. And both of those habitats, both those environments are under stress from climate change impacts and also natural variability. So we were trying to understand in the future, based on the variation in those two environments, how is that going to affect reproductive success, how it has it in the past, and how it might in the future. Um, I'm also um, helping a team with their, understand their northern spotted owl populations, um, mostly their occupancy and their reproduction. And northern spotted owls, um, an endangered species that you might be familiar with, but they were really declining due to a loss of old growth forest habitat. That was somewhat rectified, and now barred owls, which are congener from the East Coast, have moved in and severely displaced them. If you're much of the Pacific Northwest, the spotted owl populations are really crashing. So there's a lot of work trying to figure that out. And we work in one of the areas where the barred owls have not invaded heavily yet. So we're trying to understand what are those barred owl impacts and um, what is the need to basically control those barred owl. Um, so taking long-term data and understanding what those barred owl impacts are. Um, this, I'm just uh, one of many, many cooperators on this project. But um, sea otter is another endangered species whose population has been held relatively stable for a long time, hasn't been growing. So there's a lot of interest from the Fish and Wildlife Service and others in trying to expand their population. So I'm working with a team where we're trying to um, collect habitat information to understand where there might be good areas for reintroduction of these otters. And here, this otter is living in a seagrass bed rather than a kelp bed. And I'll talk about that a little more later. Also, Harbor seals coming back after the Marine Mammal Protection Act, trying to understand how their colonies interact with one another, how they how they grow, how they decline, and what that means for their management. Um, and then also, I've been working with a team on once we remove invasive plants from our dunes along the California coast. There's a lot of legacy impacts. Those invasive plants can impact the chemistry. They can impact the um, the mycorrhizal communities, they can impact the microbiome, they can also just impact things by physically leaving the tritus there. So we've been working to understand, or look at different restoration techniques that allow native and especially endangered native plants to come back more successfully. But this is the main topic that I wanted to go into a little bit deeper. Uh, this is five species of seabirds, and if you head offshore, you will, in a boat, You'll, and you have a good eye, and you know, if you're looking for, you'll encounter most of these if you travel from here out to San Francisco Bay, out to, let's say, the Maryland Islands. So these are all uh, marine birds that forage mostly on fish, but they'll also eat smaller things like plankton, zooplankton, and animal plankton. And they're all living in an environment off our California coast that is changing. There's a lot of interannual variability. There's a lot of interdecadal inter variability. And there's probably also long-term variation or even sort of secular trends based on climate change impacts on the marine environment. And that can potentially have impacts on these birds' prey bases and their ability to successfully reproduce. Um, and I just realized that the third author on this paper is in this room. But thinking about this in the context of ecosystems that have been changing a lot due to potentially climate change effects, but also to taking a lot of our higher trophic level species out of the system. Those systems like otters, those species like otters have a lot of control over what's going on further down in the food web. Um, and there's a lot of concern that similar things have happened in the ocean, some of those examples from the ocean. This is somewhat anecdotal, but it's still data. This image is from Key West in Florida, and this is the happy winners of a fishing contest, an annual fishing contest off of Key West in the 1950s. And you can see that they've caught some pretty large fish. Then the same contest, same spot, 1980s. <laughs> and then if we go to the same spot, same people in the 2000s. Okay? Um, there was a lot of talk I would say in the 90s and the early 2000s about declining fisheries and crashing fisheries. And this was part of that narrative. Um, there are a lot of people that don't feel like many fisheries are not crashing. And I'll show those slides in a minute. 
But what is obvious is there's large changes and large impacts on the systems. Um, and this also, everybody we talk part of our vernacular now, but just shifting baselines. You know, the, this is um, in whatever field you're in, but especially ecology and conservation. So here's some data that's put together by University of Washington folks. And thinking about long term from 1950 up to maybe 2005, 2000, the paper was from 2010, and thinking about the mean trophic level. So our you know trophic level, if you're high in the trophic level, you're things like tuna, sharks, and orca. And if you're low trophic level out in the ocean, you might be forage fish or going even lower, things like snow plankton or plankton. And you can see these time series showing. You know, mainly look at the black line, which is all the fish catches put together. This is not based on scientific trawl data, independent data. This is based on what people are catching out in the ocean. And you know, you can see there was kind of these concerns, especially with that dark black line for all fish catches of these declines. And then at least this lab group at uh, UW, you know, shows oh well things are actually kind of bouncing back. But you can see that there is variation through time. And there's reason to ask questions about are all of these fish, even if these lines aren't that variable, it's based on catches. And as far as I can tell, people are getting a lot better at catching fish and a lot better at having bigger boats and going further and using sonar and all kinds of illegal fishing, which is not even reported on these sorts of graphs. So a question is, does this represent what's actually available to predators on the water? It, it does represent what humans consume. Then thinking about, okay, if you're a bird, like some of our birds offshore that we're talking about, this is from a larger paper from 2011, looking at when seabird populations start to crash, when their reproductive success really, really goes down around the world. So many, many authors um, involved in this from many, many long-term monitoring programs. And uh, they coined this term one-third for the bird. And many of these birds are eating small forage fishes, like sardines, anchovies, herring. And they kind of came up with this. So we got on the x-axis, we got prey abundance. And on the y-axis, we've got breeding success. So that prey abundance is kind of a normalized or scaled score. And you can see that once they hit what they termed it about one third of the maximum amounts, they start to really see these great declines in breeding success. So th these are questions that are out there about our, you know, our birds locally. So the question is, how do we use those birds to um, see what they're eating. And I'm not gonna talk about the breeding success today, that's um, a different talk. But just to look into what, what they're eating and is that changing over time. So um, we can use this tool and we'll use this tool um, called stable isotope analysis. And um, these are just different isotopes of nitrogen, normal nitrogen has 14, um, it's, it's 14 inside its um, nucleus and sometimes they have an extra nucleus, sometimes they have an extra neutron that makes it nitrogen 15. And I guess I'll kind of add, so that extra nitrogen in there is kind of sticky. You know, it's got a little bit, it's a little bit harder to pull that apart. So it's more likely to stay in the tissues. So um, as you go from your primary producers right on the very bottom, up through the food web, that nitrogen enriched or that ratio between nitrogen 15 and nitrogen 14 and the similar effect for carbon 13. So we can use that basically as a tracer. We can figure out what those isotope values are in our birds and in our fish. And this is um, what, what fortunately we have is we can take a look at birds in museums around the country, you know, that, where people have collected these birds from 100 years ago, 120 years ago, 50 years ago. And in museum specimens, you can just take a very small piece of feather, a milligram or so, and you can get those um, isotope ratios out of them and start to put together a food web. And since we're looking at them in a museum and we can also collect some birds now or get some bird feathers now, we can start to understand are there changes over time. So uh, this is from a paper from uh, a while ago. And this is one species of bird that's part of our study species offshore. And just a short story, you got the, on the y-axis, you've got that nitrogen isotope ratio. And then on the x-axis, you can see on the points on the left are from a long time ago, points on the right are from much more recent. And we found kind of this decline in these isotope ratios. Uh, then not long after that, uh, up in British Columbia, a group at Simon Fraser uh, repeated our work like for up off of Canada and really found that same sort of trend over time uh, using museum specimens. 
Um, another group, a little more recently, looking at California Hypothesis Gulls, also found a really similar pattern, both for adults and for subadults, this decline over time. So, you know, the initial inference from this is, oh, these birds are eating lower on the food. They're eating, like, there's some sort of decline in their trophic level. They're not able to get those large fat sardines anymore. They're getting smaller, great, maybe more difficult or less energetically um, valuable. Um, although this one has a little bit of a, an extra story, whether these guys are actually just feeding more on garbage like, dumps they have access to. So uh, one of the more compelling studies, this was the lion petrel. So this is a different system. It's not right off the California coast, is um, these Hawaiian petrels. And you can see that our timeline now goes back 4,000 years. So this was taken from bone collagen that they got off the nest near that it dated, and then also look at the ice tub levels. And you can see as you get into what they term the onset of industrial fishing um, around the Hawaiian Islands, you really have this huge decline in those ice tub ratios. So they took this as pretty strong evidence that um, long term there was not a lot of variation. And then right recently, um, we saw this rapid decline. So, okay, that's all great, but it's kind of this thing tugging the back of your head. The primary producers are the ones that are kind of setting that baseline for those isotope ratios. And what if there's some background variation in those baseline isotope values? So, you know, that could happen if you were doing a garden experiment and somebody were putting nitrogen on the system, that would completely, you know, screw up your experiment. But out in the ocean, you've got currents that are moving in different directions. We've got variation, whether they're El Ninos or decadal oscillation events or whatever it might be, all these different sources of variation that might affect what our inputs are in our source nitrogen inputs. So um, these folks also thinking about it, um, uh, Bakshuri and McCarthy in 2014 took mussels. So these are it's a bivalve up and down the west coast of the US. And you can see a map on the right. Uh, San Francisco Bay is here in the middle. And all the little circle points are uh, where they took muscle samples from. And they found this gradient or this climb in the nitrogen isotope at the base of the food web. These, these muscles are, are filter feeders. They're, they're eating really, really close to the bottom of the food web. So you have this at least latitudinal variation in the California current. So what does that mean for the results that they're looking at before? And you can infer that this variation, this this climb here, probably changes from year to year, or from decade to decade, or long term with uh, with other processes. And uh, we know that if this water comes from the north and the California Current, it's depleted in uh, nitrogen or that nitrogen fifteen. And water that comes up from the south actually has more that nitrogen fifteen. So is the seabrook level diet really changing over time? Or um, are there just long-term changes in ocean isotopic chemistry at the base of the food web? So this is something we want to try and tease apart. Um, and you know, there's another sort of wrinkle in here as water temperatures increase, uh, warm water holds less oxygen. And typically when there's less oxygen, there's more denitrifying bacteria, which what fixes a lot of the nitrogen that's available for organisms out in the ocean. And that denitrifying bacteria has a tendency to really uh, increase the nitrogen isotope ratios of N15. So that's another thing you might have this other impact just from ocean warming and reduction of oxygen. Um, some folks, and this is, I don't have, oh yeah, I do have the site up here, um, used some Southern California sediment samples of nitrogen 15 again, so the same y axis as we've been looking at before, and saw this decline in these isotope ratios over time and, and made the inference or the conclusion that uh, there's actually increasing oxygen over time, which is um, against a lot of conventional wisdom. But I'll come back to that a little bit later. So what can we do to try and figure out this problem of diet versus oceanography in our affecting our bird diets or what we think are our bird diets? So something that's come online is technology that's really just been easily available in the past five years and um, it sort of developed about 15, 20 years ago. Then really so that amateurs like me can use it in really just the past five years or so. So um, each one of those proteins and uh, we're getting the nitrogen out of the protein primarily, um, when we're doing all these isotope work, we're taking all of those amino acids and just kind of running them through at the same time. We're analyzing isotope ratios. But it turns out that amino acids within the proteins actually behave differently in terms of that 
enrichment line. So some of them won't enrich, and those are all called the source ones. And some of them do enrich those two uh, happy isotopes, or those two happy amino acids on the right. So they will actually, uh, the ones that are sources don't really change. They don't really go up through time. And the ones that are trophic uh, will go up through time. So what the technology that's relatively new is looking at the specific amino acids so they're broken apart before you run these isotope ratio analyses. And we can look at both the trophic, isotope, trophic amino acids and the source amino acids. Okay, And that way we can hopefully tease apart something about the ocean impacts and something about their diet impacts. So this plot, these are our, our five happy seabird species. But the plot on the right is uh, west coast of West primarily California, yeah, just California. And we had about 17, almost 1800 samples of these seabird feathers from throughout that time series, 1880 to um, 2005, for museums and our contemporary collecting. And um, you can see those are all run as bulk isotopes. So hard for us to tease apart sources versus uh, changes in oceanography, or I'm sorry, sources versus trophic level. Um, but then we were able to just recently run, um, just a couple of years ago, these amino acid specific ones where we're looking at the trophic level versus like, the sources. And those points are not where we actually caught them. Those points are the correct latitudes, but not the correct longitudes. Most of these birds were collected on shore or just offshore if we were doing offshore captures. So um, this is the results slide, and I'll just describe it really briefly. Um, our top row are those source amino acid isotope results. The middle row is our trophic level amino acid results. And the bottom row is our, um, what we've been running, what I've been showing you all the other slides, just everything all mixed together and hard to pull a signal out of. So one thing that's encouraging, and we have on the x-axis, we have several different covariates. Uh, this latitude covariate, this mirror, mirrors that muscle isoscape when the muscles had or more enriched in the south than in the north. So that's nice that our birds actually kind of corroborate that. Um, this um, over time implies that oxygen increase that the Deutsch paper showed us. Um, if you remember this graph again, so that's kind of interesting. But Deutsch makes modeling results or created some modeling results predicting actual oxygen levels. And we use those as covariates and they don't agree. So I don't really know how to reconcile that. This um, tells us that likely there was more of that Northern California water coming in over time as we go um, through time. But what the main take home though is when we look at those trophic amino acids over whether it's year on the far right, or any of the oceanographic variables, no trophic change over time. So this really, you know, looking at both of these really helped us tease apart that in California, we don't really have evidence for trophic level change. So kind of a big difference in interpretation between what we were looking at 10 years ago based on this. So no seabird trophic level change over time, and that contradicts some of our previous ones. And you know, we've been talking to some of the folks at NOAA because they're interested in using these sorts of results for helping them to train and build some of their, their models that they build for future forecasting for what might happen out of the ocean. Um, and then I didn't really talk about the upwelling part, but I think I'll move on to the next one. So um, this next one will be a little bit clearer and there will be in chemistry. So this will be a little bit more fun. Okay, so seagrass restoration. We're gonna talk about this is an estuary up in Northern California, Point Reyes National Seashore, it's called Drake's and Sparrow. It's about 2,500 acres. I'm gonna use all non-metric units because this was a construction project working with contractors. So everything was done in material units. And um, I haven't switched everything over yet. It's inside a national park. It's inside a federally designated wilderness area. It's a state marine conservation area reserve. Um, it harbors what until recently was the largest harbor, Cal California harbor seal colony, and it has extensive seagrass on the bottom. So um, you can see the sandbars in there, that's the harbor seal call out, they have the pups, and the deeper areas are primarily full of seagrasses. And inside of this protected area, there was a large oyster lease, 
And um, this oyster lease ended in 2014. So there's a huge amount of infrastructure inside this estuary. And you can see on the top, some of the wooden racks, think of these as large docks of piers and oysters would be hung from them. And you can see on the bottom, the kind of various states of dilapidation. And one thing, as I continue through the study, I wanna say that this is a case study that's one specific area, and I don't wanna characterize all of California agriculture in this light. Um, but you can see a lot of infrastructure there. There's a scale bar there, 264 feet to really give you the idea of the massive scale of these really extending throughout that estuary. Um, many of these areas that were used for the aquatic business, for the aquaculture business, are in the seagrass habitats. And um, seagrass, and the main one that we're talking about here, is called eelgrass, Costa Marina. And there are species that are on the coast of many, you know, much of the world, but due to eutrophication and development, primarily, but more recently, really declining. Uh, it's a California species of concern. There's only about 14,000 acres in California. That's much less than there was a long time ago. Um, what much of the San Francisco Bay has been lost. Nursery habitat for a lot of things that people like to eat, like Dungeness crabs, herring, but also nursery habitat for a lot of important biodiversity species for our coast. Um, and there's been a lot of research lately on carbon sequestration uh, benefits and even some local uh, demonstrations of a very localized uh, ability to buffer ocean acidification on a very, very late. So in thinking about this project um, and trying to do some seagrass restoration after these uh, areas were removed, it's important to think about the scale of seagrass restoration on the West Coast. So this uh, Ashley Ward just published this looking at seagrass restoration projects or the number of projects along the West Coast. And one result that they found, probably one of the more important results, is this is before and after. So you can see on the y x axis is shoot density. So that's a measure of how much yield grass is there. And you can see that after restoration projects, these are all restoration projects, the median increase or change in shoot density before to after is almost negligible. The mean is kind of high because you can see you have some really successful projects. But overall, seagrass restoration science hasn't been figured out yet. Many of the reasons that it doesn't work, and this is kind of this is um, Instagram or this is a bar plot of reasons it doesn't work. Often thinking about weedy species coming in, so macro you know, you've got a highly disturbed area, it's like a roadside. Under most of those racks that I was showing you before, this is what it looked like underneath. So this is debris, plastic, an oyster shell, non-native uh, fouling and encrusting species that grow on there. And we have our target on the right. So we also have the non-native species that's from Southeast Asia. It was only growing on hard substrate, but then about 10 years ago, both here and Martha's Vineyard, it started growing on eelgrass. And you can see that that would be a really big concern. Um, this is that tunicate growing over eelgrass, and you can see how that's obviously affecting seed dispersal, obviously affecting photosynthesis. And sinks it really to the bottom, breaks it down. So this was mostly the source of this was on all of those wood racks. <laughs> so thinking about it from a park service perspective, why do we want to do these sorts of restorations? You know, everything from marine protected areas to wilderness, char wilderness character, but also climate change resilience and having more resilient habitats out there that can deal with what we don't quite anticipate yet. Restoration projects are one of two brand types. One could be active restoration where you go out there and you plant seeds. The other kind is more passive. If you have the right environmental conditions, maybe it'll just grow back. And that's what we did in this case. So um, just to show you the fun sort of contractor part of this project, removing those five miles of wooden racks out on barges, but we can't disturb the bottom because it's all um, really important habitat. So we need to do everything from barges. This is the sort of stuff that was getting pulled up off the bottom. You can imagine there's a lot of um, impact on those seagrass beds from, these are plastic PVC poles uh, that the oysters were grown on. And then using divers to kind of handle things because you can't pull everything up with, um, with the crane or with the shovel. And at the end of this project, we pulled out about 3.8 million pounds of debris. So you know, that was just collecting over and over and over again. So we set up a project for pre and post to understand what was the restoration potential. 
and what was going to happen with the restoration on this project. Um, you know, so many photographs that needed to be scored. We used this unbelievable technology from UC San Diego called CoralNet. It enables us to really quickly score all of our plots for how much eelgrass is on them, how much debris, and a whole bunch of 20 or so other targets we look at. So this is um, an ordination plot. So think about it in terms of each one of those dots is a sample where we took a picture and figured out what was on the bottom. And it could have been Sasca Marina or the eelgrass. And if so, those points are going to be really close to where it says Sasmar. If it was mostly debris, then we have points up close to where it says debris. Um, so this is a, the, the different groups are kind of compiled a little bit or compressed a little bit. But this helps us understand over time what, um, what the changes might be. And this is um, the control plots and the reference plots are going to be in green. So on the top, you can see we go through time from before the restoration to four and a half years after the restoration. The green are those reference plots. So they were not in the disturbed areas. And you can see that our heavy impact with the numbers bottoms look really, really bad. Um, all of our points are kind of in that pinkish color, are all where there's debris and defects, one of those non-native species. Green algae is kind of a weedy species. And you can see that after we did the restoration, it was mostly just sediment. And the hope is over time, it's going to move and basically become indistinguishable from the control areas. And you can see that some of our plots did actually improve. Some of the plots also kind of went back to the kind of weedy plots. If we look at our lesser impact areas, so there wasn't eelgrass here, but there wasn't tons of debris on the bottom. You can see over time, by, the, by year 4.5, the two ellipses actually are 99% on top of each other. So we really have to that. But this um, tells us there's some more work to be done with the heavy impact. Um, we're working with a student from San Francisco State, uh, Cirilla, and eelgrass, which is this image on the right, uh, can reproduce or spread odorous rhizomes, but it can also spread sexually as flowering plants. And um, trying to understand whether those areas that were successful, did it reproduce and move in through the rhizomes or did it move in sexually through seeding? And so is doing some genetic work to help us understand that. That could help inform potentially our project in the future, but more importantly, other projects as they move forward. Um, and then sort of an interesting thing in this area, part of what we're doing is thinking about this spot and several other spots along the West Coast as potential, potentially good sea otter habitat. So I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of good work being done trying to assess what would be the carrying capacity of these areas if sea otters were ever to come back. And um, so we also are working with a variety of other folks on a lot of data collection around that and folks are building those models. So to end, um, I want to talk about some of the things I've been doing while I'm here at Berkeley that are more on the student education, trying to get students involved. So um, this is a quote from our natural resources lead the National Park Service. We're very good at collecting data over decades and decades and decades, but maybe less good at what we do with those data. She's being, you know, she's being a little self-deprecating. We do a lot of good things with a lot of our data, but we don't always have all of the um, we don't always have all the follow that we need to turn that data into knowledge and management. Um, one project that you know, we've started with, with Justin's help is trying to take some of that data and really help us think about how we can make climate change adaptation or climate change management response decisions. But thinking about all of those data, this is just in the Western part of the US. And I would say that this is maybe half of our data streams, maybe a quarter, but these are the formal ones around the, the ones that are gray are the ones that are in California national parks, but I've also got Pacific Islands and up in Washington, Oregon. And um, a lot of this is monitoring data. Um, a lot of it, you know, we collect the data, we do the data management. We, we sometimes fall short of the data analysis and really turning it into knowledge. Sometimes fall short on publishing it, at least in peer reviewed journals. And a lot of this data is observational. It's hard to make inferences from observational data. So uh, one thing that I'm kind of starting to think more about and trying to work with our park service scientists and some of our partners is how we turn some of that information or that data into information. So, or into knowledge. So this is an icon just showing, okay, this is some trend data for water quality or for a seal or whatever it might be. And without any mechanistic understanding, we can't really do a lot with that. We don't really gain a lot of knowledge. 
So we usually look at covariates. Maybe here's covariate A and B. Maybe that's going to explain what you know what what what's controlling our populations or what's controlling the impacts on our on our environment. And the problem is we're not very good at thinking about well how does A have impacts on B? And maybe there's other environmental variables or other variables out there that has an effect on A and B. So it's really hard for us to figure out and tease apart all of the causes. Um, this uh, by a guy named Macquarie um, calls this causal salad. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, careful scientists are not doing this, but this does happen a lot in trying to assign, um, assign effects to things that might not really be causal effects. So um, what I've been trying to work on with some of the students that I've been bringing in, some UC Berkeley undergrads, and in integrating them into some of these data sets that we have in the previous pages, is thinking about setting up analyses that are in this causal analysis framework. And you know, there we can turn off and on some of the interactions between some of our covariates and try and really get at what are the true causal things. So that if we want to make some sort of intervention or some sort of management decision, what's going to have the, the biggest impact? So um, I want to show a couple of little case studies, just one or two slides each, of some of the students. These are all UCB undergrads and grad students over the past couple of years. And you know, my motivation is to try and bring these students in to help help you know help them learn, but also to diversify what our knowledge is in the National Park Service. Ideally, some of these folks want to work with us and apply for jobs in the future and get long-term internships. So um, it's really kind of a win-win for all of us. Um, a couple of the first students that I started working with, um, this is Nora and Brandon. Um, and I got them through the um, data science discovery program, but then brought them on and, and we actually paid them. Um, there's long-term water, water flow data sets in the Sierras. And a lot of that data is just not worked up yet. And a lot of the code is old. So uh, these two were able to really clean up a lot of that old code, even find bugs, produce plots like this. Um, you can look on the y-axis. It's from 1920 to the present. We're almost to the present. And along the x-axis is the month. And you can see the discharges of the water coming down. And you can see most of that is snow melt in cubic feet per second. You can see most of it's coming down in you know, month five, month six, so May, June. Then you see these big spikes. And this helps park going really think about and document are there changes over time, both in the distribution, but also in the peaks and valleys of water coming off the snow melt. Um, so this, their, their work, their code is now going to be incorporated into our work as well. Um, this is uh, CC Chen, who just graduated. She's now um, off in China working as a marine mammal research assistant. Not marine mammal, sorry. Um, and she and Noor uh, helped us work up a data set on prairie falcons from Pinnacles National Park. And um, it also is kind of in this causal analysis framework, looking at all the different variables that are affecting the occupancy and the breeding success of these prairie falcons. And you can see at the bottom, peregrine falcons, species most people are familiar with, DDT basically dropped them out of the system 50, 60 years ago. They're starting to come back. And then trying to really tease apart with winter precipitation and long, short drought, this really, this really dry environment, um, what is it that's really driving their populations? So, um, you know, so CC primarily working this causal analysis framework with the occupancy models is really able to come out with, as these peregrines are coming back on the left plot on the x axis, and they're either, the peregrines are either taking the site and occupying it or they're actually reproducing there it's making the prairie falcon sites decline over time. So it's a species that the park really identified as being an important iconic, important part of the ecosystem. Now even other important bird coming back. So the park needs to think about these, but, um, and, and what, are their, what are their targets? But this is really helping us tease apart also on the right, as normalized winter precipitation increases, we're actually seeing lower reproduction. And we think that this is due to this unobserved variable of vegetation, which is kind of grayed out um, and how it's related to uh, the rainfall. Because when there's less vegetation, there are more efficient hunters because they can find those mammals on the ground. Um, this is uh, TTN, who is a CRS student who just graduated, just starting at UCSB now. She's helping us look at endangered tidewater gobies. We have a long-term data set trying to understand what's controlling their populations. Uh, this is Rodale Lagoon on the bottom left. So the Pacific Ocean's out on the um, on the left, and then you can see the lagoon um, down on the right. And 
occasionally, or actually almost every year, this lagoon breach that allows fresh water out, allows salt water in, um, allows kind of cleaning up of the water. So uh, TTN's been working on this model, thinking about how all these covariates interact and that causal analysis framework to try and come up with what are interventions of any that you would pursue if you were trying to um, trying to make sure that uh, adobe population persisted. So um, just a variety of things, you know, whether it's rainfall affecting the breaches, there's some more water coming down, not available oxygen in the water, sculpins are present on adobe. So um, trying to tease this apart and not just throwing it into one big generalized linear model. And then I think this might be my last example. Um, back to the elephant seals, you got the big male there on the left, uh, you got a female on the right, and you got a pup to, and you got a pup on the far right. Um, and her scale, that pup probably weighs about 200 pounds, and that male probably weighs on the order of 4,000 pounds. So um, these are the ones that I mentioned that the um, population was down to less than 100, less than 200. About 100 years ago, small, they were thought to be extinct, a small population was found on Guadalupe Island. Uh, it was an expedition from Cal Academy of Sciences that found them. And what do you think the first thing they, Cal Academy did when they found it? Yep, they collected a few. So the so conservation uh, thought changes through time. So from that population though, there are now about at least 300,000 in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. So in the area that I'm showing here and then further north. So the population is really large and it makes it difficult to monitor these populations. So silence um, has been helping us um, and actually is really now done. We just need to submit it. Um, think about um, more efficient ways of counting and monitoring. Um, so Silas uh, with aerial imagery that we got from NOAA um, is basically developed um, a deep learning model with convolutional neural networks. And uh, the sort of the, when we started this project, you know, this is becoming very complex. When we started this project, the novel part, the part that was still difficult was multiple species and multiple age classes um, in one model that could deal with all of this. Um, the way things are now, uh, you know, just two years later, these things are much, much simpler, much, much more commonplace. But, but this is where we are now. And um, in doing sort of some ground truthing, the, if we got on the, y, on the X axis, our eyeball counts. And we've got on the Y axis, what the computer or the neural network counts. And you can see for bulls, it's not so good. Um, we didn't have a large sample size. We usually not on a lot of the beaches. But as we go to cows and pups, we have really, really reliable. So this is telling us that we really can use this um, aerial imagery, whether it ends up being drones, possibly satellites, but you know, possibly aerial imagery. Um, and then take that same model and then apply it to a different species of carbon seal, also really high accuracy rate. Um, and we're also, we're talking now with Smithsonian, who's trying to develop a program where they can serve up these sorts of uh, I guess, AI solutions for wildlife monitoring. So this example and this code hopefully will help them move their model a little bit forward because we have a partnership with them. Not all of our internships are data internships. So we have Luis helping us describe and document a new endemic species down at Pinnacles National Park. Um, Agnes developed uh, along with VTN, our whole website and all of those, all those lines that were on the very first graph I showed between the parks and all the universities, we're trying to get out short science communication pieces on all of those, which are on our website now. And Agnes was the one that really put all those together. Um, and she just is starting on Monday with AmeriCorps as an urban forester, which is exactly what she wants to do. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of projects that were just funded. We'll be recruiting students who are working on red-legged frog phenology. And this is also another endangered species archaeology project at Pinnacles and more science communication. Um, and then I, Really want to think about this program. You know, I'm one person kind of supervising all these. Eventually, I'd like to develop it into a little bit more of a program. There are federal, federal internships, federal science internships, um, and maybe have a grad student or some sort of uh, some sort of staff that can really help grow and build out this program. And there's a lot of collaborations on campus where we might be able to do that. Um, and then kind of closing, also trying to trying to help where I can think about, you know, undergraduate education, field science, getting students out in the field, you know, a little bit selfish, getting students into national parks, 
but um, you know, trying to engage these folks that are really our future and really have perspectives that we need. They need to um, for a successful park service and successful conservation. Um, and, and this group actually has written up um, sort of a report on the whole program for Park Science Magazine, which Fred and I are helping them kind of finalize to get that published. I've been working a lot over the past 10 years with this um, Berkeley Environmental Leadership Program. And these are folks from around the world that come to Berkeley for three weeks or so to talk about environmental management. Um, I talk to them, take on field trips about park management, monitoring, but I learn way more from them, I think, than they learn from me. Um, unbelievable, some of the some of the programs that these folks have run and expertise. Um, and then last, um, I'm really fortunate in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna get to go off to help out mostly on sort of the data science, experimental design field work stuff with the 24 students that are out in Morea right now doing the um, biology and geology of biology and geomorphology of tropical islands. Um, so I'm, I'm reading some of my tropical biology books before I head down. And then I believe this is just about the last thing, so I'm kind of coming up on time. But um, one thing that, uh, especially over the past year, these are University of California and Cal State University field stations that are in or are just adjacent to national parks. Most of them are in. Most of them are in those field stations or operating those field stations under the authority of the CDSU. That's how we do a cooperative agreement, the city groups of buildings. And we just put a bunch of other stuff in there, like we will collaborate on research and education. We don't always meet the mark on those collaborating on research and education parts. So um, over the past year, I got together um, about 15 or so university folks representing all those field stations, uh, 15 or so National Park Service folks that represent those parks. And we developed, we have a draft document out just for internal review right now, thinking about and trying to make it more programmatic how we work together. Because a lot of these are kind of one-offs, park to park, park. Thinking about coordinating research, coordinating research needs in the parks and how they can be communicated with field stations. And also try to take some of the headaches away from the UC and the CSU, CSU folks having to deal with our bureaucracy. Um, so on the science side, education side, but also the bureaucracy side. Um, I think that is all I wanted to talk about, other than a lot of people that help with some of those research programs, especially that I've been working on. And I'm happy if you have time to answer questions. Doesn't look like you necessarily do, but you can do the questions outside. Yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much for the talk and also for all the training and engagement you're doing with our undergraduate students. Too. I, I see more and more of uh, who are you know, talking about working with you and the practical experiences they're getting through this. So incredibly cool and important for our community. I wanted to ask um, a little bit about, I mean, I've had programs through the CSU, but it's never been quite clear to me. In most of those cases, those are sort of things developed on the side that we then administer through the CSU. I occasionally see advertisements from um, from parks, individual parks, and park service, or some of the other agencies that are partners. I want to get your sense for everyone in the room who might be interested in engaging. How much of it is actually like, how much, you know, what percent of uh, projects are like out, put out there for public call, and to what degree are they, you know, are they mostly projects that are developed through relationships that have already been developed between universities and programs? Yeah, you, you yeah no, very, very good question, and, um, and a common question. So I would say that about 90, so, so the Park Service, about 90% of our projects are relationship-based. It's like, Hey, I know that there's somebody at Berkeley that would like to work on this, or I'll, I'll call them up and maybe we can co-develop a project together. I've got some money, they've got some time, and we can figure it out. Other agencies are more prone to do like the RFP. Yeah. We post those on our website. Um, I think that because the Park Service primarily does it through those relationships, a big part of the reason they have a position like mine is to understand what are the park needs, What's coming down the pipe, where there might be money, like where there are needs, because not every project, but where there are needs. And then also to understand what the faculty expertise and interest is across that network and the museum folks, Cal Academy and everywhere else, um, and try and put those folks together. So I don't want to call it an ad hoc system, but it's 
um, a lot of it is right here. And it, one way to think about it is you're part of the CSU network, we're part of the CSU network. So we've already agreed to work together. But what we need to do is better communicate our needs. And that's part of what the field station one is about, but also the research and education needs of the parks and figuring out a better way to do that or investing time, which is part of our job. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the um, orientation plots you show in the Yale Grass Restoration Project. Were those just drawings used to do computation in the computer? Like what? Yes. It, it basically, if you look at the ordination plot in the two dimensions, what they do is you put in basically the, the raw data that goes in is species composition. So 80% eel grass, 10% sediment, you know, 10% trash or something like that. And uh, the ordination works out a way to represent that in two dimensional space so that it's separated enough so that you can visualize it and you can look at it statistically to see if there are differences. So yeah, it's a good way to think about it. It's kind of like a percent cover. Like, I'll get your point. Yeah, of course. Berkeley's been kind of underutilizing the opportunities to the CBSU. I mean, so many of us are trying to apply for NSF, et cetera, and 10% success rate. There's money they're just dying to have, especially with the resources of the military, especially the Navy and the Army, they have these great resources. And they just look at the people. So it looks like spreads the number of faculty. Look into this and check that out with money. And people is great science and just speaking is great science. I didn't heard this stuff, but I just thought to be a director and just be like, you do a lot of things. That was the thing. It's my life easy. But um, I, I think it's something you should be more aware of. Take advantage of it. Thanks. And I think, um, I think that and I mentioned part of my role is to think about the relationship between the Park Service, like and what Kilsman was asking about, projects. I've also got been trying to, to wrangle a group of all those federal folks, and about seven of them, eight of them are participating, so that we can talk about what are our common research needs that are coming up. And that's towards that goal of, you know, if we can co-fund a particular PI, a particular group of projects, but also to think about just those beds going out across our borders. For so those are all sorts of, those are goals that we, that we do, but it would be done much All right. Um, yeah, thank you again. And um, yeah, my office is I, the shortest commute to this talk ever. I'm at 32. And um, happy to, yeah, I'm on campus typically two or three days a week. Happy to talk about anything, whether they're just basic ideas, student ideas, research ideas that you might have, because I'm talking constantly with all the parks in the West. Um, so thank you.